Hey everyone, I'm Nathan, and in case you missed it, Drawfee just had their 10 year anniversary. That's 10 years of hilarious characters being created and then just sitting by the wayside, waiting for someone to see the potential in this unused IP to create a Drawfee cinematic universe. So come along with me as I act as our resident Kevin Feige as I illustrate five different concepts for the first five installments of this cinematic universe that'll all eventually cultivate in a crossover phenomenon. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it right now. Movie 1, Ribbit Ranger and Mero Biba. I know what you're thinking, Nathan, are you seriously proposing that we star our Drawfee cinematic universe with a Ribbit Ranger Mero Biba movie? And to answer you, yes, yes I do. <laughs> but Nathan, those characters are so old, are they still relevant in 2024? I mean, I think so, but I must admit when Karina made Made the new print for the 10 year anniversary, go buy it now, it's super cute. I was a little self-conscious. Obviously, Marobiba probably wouldn't make the cut because parody characters can get you in trouble with copyright, but seeing that there was no Ribbit Ranger, I was a little self-conscious. But my answer to this is that, you know, there was a time when Thor and Captain America and Iron Man were seen as like C-level characters. The Marvel Cinematic Universe really made them the household names they are today. And so I, I think if it's a good movie, people will love them. <laughs> um, but in order to help with the fact that, you know, maybe these characters are a little old, I included Jacob Horse to, you know, hold down the fort. I feel like Jacob Horse and Mero Biba would get along very swimmingly. I think their personalities mesh really well. They both have this sort of carefree energy, whereas Ribbit Ranger can sort of be the curmudgeon of the group. And I feel like that's a good transition into plot. So what is the first movie about? I think we follow Mero Biba, who is such a fan favorite character, iconic, immortal. Um, I think she gets isekai'd into the world of Ribbit Ranger, but I think it's not like an all frog world. I think it's literally an internet world. I'm basically ripping off Digimon, but instead of like monsters that she catches, it's more like she gets sucked into a digital internet world where all of the most horrific, funniest, terrible memes go and materialize and gain sentience. So it's like the digital world from Digimon, but it's just literally all of these junk ideas from Drawfee becoming an actual world. I think that this is a great duo because this idea comes from the original Ribbit Ranger episode where they were just sort of memeing around. And I think Karina was the one that was like, this is just an isekai, like you got isekai'd into this world and now you're with this hunky frog. Um, so I took that idea and I merged it from the content from the Hunger Games simulator stream on Twitch, which I just think is such a funny <laughs> Twitch stream. I think about it all the time. It literally lives in my head and gives me brain rot. But I just love that dynamic of Ribbit Ranger and Mira Biba being like a True Grit or a Last of Us or a Stranger Things, where it's that trope of young, innocent girl and like old, grizzled man form an unlikely alliance and have to travel and adventure together. I think that's a great trope. I think it pulls on the heartstrings. It's relatable. Um, so yeah, that would be the story for this first movie. I've zoomed in here to do the inking. Spoilers ahead, but there is going to be a delete your art moment because I actually sort of don't like the pose that I have for Rupert Ranger here. I also made his head more frog-like. Obviously, these will never become actual movies. Like, that would be literally insane. But I do think there's a world where Drawfee should have a collaboration either with Webtoon, but maybe they don't want to work with them because of, like, corporate ethics guidelines or something like that, or maybe Drawfee develops their own app, but I could see them having like a series of comics with image as an imprint or with on an app, like maybe like Tapas or something, where there's just a series of like web comics starring a bunch of beloved Drawfee characters. <laughs> Julia, hire me. Um, I'm kidding. But I do think it would be very profitable and we would give them all our money to read these stories. But yeah, um, I am going to change this pose because I want it to just look like he's actually running. Um, originally, I just wanted them sort of in a generic action pose. The concept of them being chased by this windmill is actually a later addition. Because um, <laughs> I was going to lean more into these are all comic ideas instead of cinematic universe ideas. Because what are cinematic universes based off of? Comics. I just thought that was clever. Uh, but yeah, I end up 
getting rid of the comic cover angle because to be honest, I just don't have a passion for graphic design and I did not want to design a typeface for or a font for Ribbit Ranger and Marabiba. So I just ended up really making this windmill guy who's chasing them even larger and a focal point. Um, yeah, and now it's more of a traditional movie poster, which I think is perfectly fine. Um, and now this is where I'm deleting my art. <laughs> Look at it one last time, cause it's gone. And now I am drawing Ribbit Ranger correctly. Uh, so it actually appears like he's running through space. He's just a little bit more anatomically correct, but I would love to do more exploration with his designs to see like how old and grizzled, but still hunky can I make him? Cause I do think a big part of Ribbit Ranger's character is that he's kind of a hunk. Um, but I think the dynamic between him and Maribibo would work better if he was like, older and more jaded like he's lived a long complicated life so yeah negotiating that is really fun to do i also got so lucky that i found this youtube video of britney broski talking wearing a cowboy hat because she had met beyonce and that was just very helpful because she turns her head like crazy in that youtube video and i was like oh my gosh yes angles for a cowboy hat. I use that as reference so much. It was so useful. So sometimes you can find little golden nuggets <laughs> in the algorithm. But yeah, um, what do you all think of this idea for the first movie? I think a good isekai. Oh my gosh. Sorry, I just got this jump scare. Look at how great this redrawing of Jacob Horse is. It was so fun to do. I loved having his nose more forward. I feel like he looks a little less Moomin and much more recognizable as Jacob Horse. Uh, Maribiba was perfectly fine, so I didn't have to touch her at all, but it was really fun pushing and pulling the noodliness of Jacob Horse's body. That was really fun. Uh, yeah, but finishing my thought, what do you guys think of this story and and the concept of an isekai. Um, what kind of things would be in this digital world? I think it would be all of the drawfy stuff we know and love, which is really fun, but I don't want it to be Wreck-It Ralph. Like we're not in an internet city, it's giving Digimon because I want there to be like trees and environments and I just want it to look cute. So I think it should give more adventure time in terms of aesthetic value. Does that make sense? Like it needs to feel kind of like a fantasy world, even though we're relying on sci-fi elements. Um, that's just my opinion. And maybe it could be a video game, like we could go more that route, like Sword Art Online. But I just like the idea of eventually Marobiba and <laughs> Rivet Ranger getting to the level where they're meeting the people making the memes and shit posting on the internet. And it's just the hosts of Drawfee. <laughs> and it's just this really funny. Um, back and forth. I just feel like that would be fun. Also, going back to the hypothetical of this being a cinematic universe, characters that aren't going to be depicted in this movie poster, um, but like lessons learned from Marvel, is that there definitely needs to be like a Nick Fury character. So someone who shows up after the credits to talk to Marabiba, like she's probably going to, in isekai fashion, eventually get out of the digital world and be back in her real world where she's going to have like learned her lessons and take that with her so that she can solve whatever things she was dealing with in reality. But there should definitely be a character who's filling in the role of like mysterious detective-y person in the real world who is like either recruiting her to a cause or something or watching her. But anyway, I think that that character, our Nick Fury, should be, wait for it, Schmidt. Okay, now hear me out. Nathan, that's crazy. Schmidt, as in Schmando, as in Schmidt and Nando, our favorite gay couple. Yes, I think Schmidt would make an excellent Nick Fury character. One, they both wear trench coats. The logic speaks for itself. Aesthetically, he's already halfway there. But I think um, our little useless, <laughs> he really is useless, isn't he? Um, model Schmidt should be working for like a shield parody sort of um, organization that's in charge of keeping track of these otherworldly phenomenons. Like maybe there is a leak coming from the digital world that's streaming into our real world and it's causing a bunch of serious problems and he's trying to 
contain it. So he's like, at the end of the end credits, he talks to Marabiba and maybe her mom or something. I don't know. Is her mom a bear? Things that need to be figured out. <laughs> um, yeah, so he would appear after the end credits and he's like a connection and a through line for the other five movies that I will talk about later on in the video. I am really happy with like where we are um, in terms of shape language. You can see that I gave these huge legs to the windmill. Originally, his little tiny legs were just not giving the depth and shape language I needed for it. But I took inspiration from that palanquin from oh, Beauty and the Beast, the Disney movie. And I was like, oh, that's so scary and creepy. Yeah, it should be these like giant legs that are more spidery. And as soon as I figured that out, it was great because we still have this feeling of massiveness. Like he's definitely huge and above them. Um, but yeah, it just, it really helped the image. And yeah, I kept the background very simple. It's just sky, a couple of trees, a little um, warped fish eye-ness on the land underneath them and a little barn ranch kind of setup. So yeah, we, we get the feeling of where we are, but the most important thing about the image is Marabiba. We understand her character. She's obviously this carefree girl. Um, <laughs> we get to know Jacob Horse really well. He's just happy to be here. And um, our hero, uh, Rivet Ranger, has this lasso that I'm adding in to, you know, save the day. Like maybe he's about to, I don't know, lasso a cow and fling it into the windmill's mouth to like satiate his hunger. I don't know. Or maybe he's going to like lasso something and then do that thing from SpongeBob where they end up on the Alaskan bullworm's back and they're riding it. Not sure. This is obviously just concept art. <laughs> um, but yeah, with that being done, this is the finished first illustration. And now it's time for our second movie. Movie two, Moonpaw. So as we established, there are two worlds, our world and then the digital world. And there is a leak happening where things from the digital world are escaping and infecting reality. So I think one such victim of this infection is both Moonpaw and their brother, Sai. This is going to be a sad image. Like, this isn't a very happy-go-lucky <laughs> um, portrayal. Obviously, I think I'd rather have just, like, Karina's original story. Like, it shouldn't have to be incorporated into this cinematic universe. But I thought the characters were really great, and I, I felt like I could make it fit in in an interesting way. And one of the characters that we know from Karina's Twitter is the character Dai, who is literally death personified. And uh, he has, like, this cute little... Uh, you know, chibi form that's like an animal, and then also this huge hunky man form. So since there is a death character, that reminded me of Yu Yu Hakusho. Um, and yeah, basically I killed, I killed Sai, he's dead. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's like Yu Yu Hakusho, but instead of like, he has to be kissed by someone, I think that uh, Sai was murdered, and there is this like mystery element around who murdered him, and it's up to our hero and protagonist, um, <laughs> Moonpaw, who has to deal with grief, and while they're dealing and grieving with their brother, they're also finding out that um, there was foul play. So I think the, the fun sort of anime aspect of it is like, if Moonpaw can solve who killed sigh within a certain time frame like maybe it's like by the next full moon or the next time i don't know google has the original logo and not a funny piece of art that corresponds to an obscure holiday <laughs> something internet related and niche if by the time that ticking clock goes off Moonpa has figured it out and gotten justice, Sai will come back to life. And yeah, that's the premise, that's the plot of the movie. I feel like it'll be really fun. <laughs> and while this mystery is being solved, we also fold in elements from the magical girl genre. At some point, Moonpa can like transform and gain powers and abilities to fight off, I guess, demons who are the little henchmen that are responsible <laughs> for the devastating murder of their brother. You can see that I'm just inking Dai right now. I love that their tail is like smoky and I drew him sitting on the scythe. I obviously, if you know anything about my channel, I'm obsessed with Magical Girls. It's one of my favorite 
uh, types of genre. I just think it's like this perfect intersection of superhero and cutesiness. It makes me really happy. So I was channeling a lot of Sailor Moon, but also a little bit of Cardcaptor Sakura, like the little uh, chimera in that I feel like was giving lots and lots of dye energy. So that was fun. And then, yeah, I was also like looking at fan art of Yu Yu Hakusho. And I just remember so well as a little kid watching it and being like, oh my gosh, this guy is dead and he has to come back to life. So I have <laughs> um, Sai sort of floating in this very funny position. And I just love the different facial expressions that I did in this piece because like Moonpa is literally crying their eyes out. Like it's emotional. Their brother's dead <laughs> and, and floating right above them. <laughs> their brother is just like, oh my gosh, like why can't they figure out this murder? I want to come back to life. I wish I could just talk to Moonpa. That would be so much easier <laughs> and Dai is just like well that's not how it works so yeah I don't know I think yeah I think Dai can only be seen and talked to through or with um with Sai and then Sai probably has to follow the normal rules of being dead like maybe he can possess bodies and levitate things I think at some point um we have the Stranger Things moment where you know um Winona Ryder is like realizes Will is alive and talks to him through the Christmas lights. I think that'll eventually happen, uh, but I don't know when or where. Uh, yeah, I just have, I wanted to draw Moonpaw sitting on their bed outside the window. I just wanted to have like a cityscape to sort of show a little bit of, you know, where they live and just little elements of their room. And yeah, I you can't tell in the final image because the computer screen is too small, but I have it that Moonpa Googled, how do you figure out who killed your brother? <laughs> it typed into Google, which I just thought was really funny. Um, yeah, and I, ooh, I decorated their walls with stickers and a couple posters and a cork board, which is really fun. I love the like magical, fire effect that's going on Sai right now to feel sort of like ghosty which I thought was nice. I love these beautiful purples. Um, you can see it becomes more of a pink. I wanted to have this spotlight effect coming very graphically off of the laptop which is very fun. And then yeah I'm just playing with shadows, playing with colors. Um, as always, if you have photo light sensitivity, just be careful whenever you watch any of my videos. There are a lot of adjustment layers in my drawing practice and pipeline. So yeah, you've been warned. Always be a little cautious as you watch these videos. But yeah, we are very quickly reaching the end of the moon pop portion of the video. I do, of course, last minute adjustment layers. I add that moon so it feels even more shoujo-y. And then I think the very last step I do is actually fill out all of these stickers with just different references to different fandoms I'm in. And then I make that poster, the tarot card of Karina from my video in the past. And yeah, this is the finished illustration. I apologize for making it so sad. And in terms of cinematic universe, I think there is one reference to the first movie, which is after the end credits. Schmidt will show up and is now recruiting the once again alive Sai and Moonpaw to join this organization investigating the digital world. So that brings us to movie three, Sarah Pena and Hunter Richardson. Yes, you have probably noticed that these are all characters already featured on my channel that I've talked about in the past. And I'm me, obviously, I'm I'm going to favor my favorite characters to be in the Drawfee Cinematic Universe. I am so sorry if your niche uh, Drawfee fave is not represented. My deepest apologies. But they could they could appear as supporting characters. Comment down below. But I'm going to stick with just my absolute favorite Blorblows. So Hunter Richardson and Sarah Pena, a magical, wonderful, sapphic duo. I think they're iconic, and I would make their genre be paranormal. So I would be taking my inspiration mainly from Gravity Falls, and almost like there's no references to the fact that the phenomenon that they experience and fight against are coming from the internet. Like, we know that as the viewers of the cinematic universe, but if you just watched this movie, you'd be like, oh, they fight zombies, because I just feel like it'd be cool to see them fighting zombies. So where we are now is that they have stolen this car, which is a convertible, because they're in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, and yeah, they're just bashing heads and taking names, because I feel like that would be fun. But I would set their movie at a summer camp, 
and I would have the camp counselor be Nando. What? Nando? As in Schmidt and Nando? Okay, I'm not going to do the bit again. Yeah, Nando. And so Schmidt is not in this movie except for maybe at the end. But I like the idea of like Nando and Schmidt are already dating. They're already a couple. But Nando doesn't work for this organization. He's just like his odd job is that now he's the director of the summer camp and yeah things go very wrong when there's a zombie invasion this honestly writes itself i think sarah and hunter would be counselors and either they're at the camp early and they're just getting things ready before the campers arrive or the campers are there and (laughs) there's just all these jokes about like oh very clearly that camp counselor has become a zombie but why aren't we talking about this i Lots of opportunities for gags um, and other paranormal activities. And so Hunter Richardson and Sarah Pena become experts at, you know, fighting all of those paranormal witches, werewolves, just Gravity Falls villains. And (laughs) eventually Nando gets saved by them and ends up telling Schmidt, like, oh, you should definitely recruit these two lesbians. I know they'd be perfect for your silly little organization. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's pretty much the whole premise. I was going to draw them in camp counselor t-shirts, but then I just sometimes at camps, especially like sleepaway camps, there are these like balls or dances or hoedowns that are themed and so I just liked the idea of what if one of the nights uh, is like prom themed or high school themed something like that and all the camp counselors and campers dress up in just really cute outfits like they're going to prom or something yeah so that explains uh, Hunter's outfit but not so much uh, Sarah's because she's just wearing this cute outfit that's a ripoff from the Mean Girls movie. I'm sorry, I had to say it. I have to tell you where my references are. I just thought that Renee Rapp looked really cool in this outfit, and so I wanted to draw Sarah in it. Now you can't unsee it, which is great. Uh, Yeah, and so I just drew her with a baseball bat. Lovely. And so she's going to be bashing the heads of zombies, which is going to be so iconic and so fun. I've been talking about how I'm using the Phase 1 of Marvel as my template. Obviously, in that scenario, there was a sequel, but instead of doing Iron Man 2 or Mira Beeb and Robert Ranger 2, I wanted to do five unique illustrations. If you really zoom in on this, I love how I did their makeup. I just felt like I really popped off. And sometimes, you know, when your job is to draw, there are periods of times where you experience ebb and flow, where sometimes it's like really easy to draw and you're passionate about it, and other times where you're like, zonked out and you lose steam and it's really funny because at the beginning of this drawing process when I was just drawing these two characters I was like all in so basically I was experiencing like oh so much I was in a flow state it was going really well but then when I had to draw the background I like couldn't do it so yeah this is actually the last piece that I finished because I just had no no desire to draw a car and a background. I don't know why I do these things to myself, but the show must go on. So sometimes you just have to follow what you want to draw. And I knew I could keep getting work done if I moved on to the next piece and I was just drawing characters because I was in a character drawing mood. And then there's a whole full circle moment, which spoilers, but the very last piece I worked on was really background heavy and, but I was inspired to draw that background. And so that got me jazzed to draw backgrounds. So when I came back um, the, with the magic of editing, it looks like I did this all at once, but I didn't. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just really cool that I found my groove and I got into a background mood and so I could finish out strong. <laughs> but there was, there was this whole edited out time of me not having fun uh, drawing the background of this. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed that look behind the curtain. These videos take a really long time to make, and obviously there are going to be periods of excitement and discouragement whilst I'm working on them. But I've got the handle on this car now. You can see that I've used the liquify tool to sort of give it another unrealistic and surreal perspective that just brings me a lot of joy. I'm about to get into drawing all of the background Uh, zombies that I keep talking about but haven't actually materialized yet. And my inspiration for those were from when Karina drew a poster as fan art for her favorite K-pop group twice. That was a really good video. But I loved how she drew the zombies in that because they all had these like cube heads and square fingers. 
it was just delightful. So I end up lifting them directly. Uh, these are all Drawfee characters anyway. I might as well use the really amazing, super cool zombie designs. Uh, here they are now. Look at them come into existence. And yeah, I also just play a lot with Silhouette. So they have a very big Scooby-Doo feel, which I think fits nicely into the paranormal genre as well. So yeah, this is the finished image. Love how it turned out. Uh, a very simple background, but we finished strong. I found the confidence and we got it done and I'm happy with how it came out. So let's go ahead and move on to our next installment. Movie four, Loose. Okay, so it's been a moment since we've been in the digital world. Obviously we were there for movie number one, but now we have two installments in the real world. So it's time that we go back and we explore the digital world a little bit. And the inspiration for this is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think the fourth installment was the famous band of duos, Thor and Loki. So um, I wonder who could be the equivalent inside the Drawfee canon. I went with Luce and his brother Rory. Um, yeah, and then also the third person you see here is Dahlia. And this is a total mind goof. So one of the members of my Patreon requested that Nevada be used inside this image. And Dahlia and Nevada, I got my two... Um, my two ladies mixed up, so I did not draw Nevada. I am so sorry to that patron. I drew Dahlia instead because I got them mixed up, and I'm sorry. But I shouldn't have because Nevada was literally in the episode where Rory was introduced in. Um, that episode with uh, Rebecca Roney, I think it was a, a four artists, one description challenge. So I should have gotten that right, but I didn't get it right. The plot of this movie is essentially that, yeah, we are inside the Drawfee internet world, but we're in a part of it that's more D&D coded than Adventure Time coded, and we're following some troublemakers. So this is where we're getting a little uh, window into who is actually causing all of this stuff to go down. And I have Loki, aka Rory, being a very big antagonist. So he is fulfilling the role of the person who's sort of causing the internet leakage and corruption to be spilling out into the real world. I don't know how he's doing this, but he most certainly is. So this is the point where he's been traveling with Dahlia and Luce, and they've actually all together been doing this, but Luce thinks that what they're doing is good. I think he's being hoodwinked in some way. Um, but over the course of the movie, it's going to end up with him realizing, oh, my brother has been tricking me into doing all of this horrible stuff that's in, that has been hurting a bunch of people in this other dimension, which is the real world. And yeah, they're going to have a falling out and Luce is going to have his corruption arc. So yeah, it should be it should be a good time. And for this image, I just had it be located in like a D and D castle dungeon esque background. There's some banners on the walls, which is really fun. I sort of gave Dahlia a little bit of a different outfit. I don't know. She ends up sort of looking like Santa Claus because I made her outfit like red and sparkly, but I didn't mind that too much. Um, I think her aesthetic matches. Uh, looses very well. They both just look like strippers. Good for them. I guess that's just how you dress when you're in this other world. Um, but yeah, the, I think that they go on all of these fetch quests to get these objects. And in my illustration, I just made it a key. I don't know why. I'm, I'm not as creative as I look, I guess. But it could. they could really be anything. They're like these MacGuffins that Rory knows how to manipulate the arcane properties of these particular objects in order to cause the rift between these worlds. And Luce, over the course of the movie, realizes that he has actually been hurting the people inside the real world and has a change of heart, gets corrupted at some point because he stands up to his brother. And then ultimately, yeah, that, that'll probably be the resolution. I don't think he actually comes to our world, though. I think this movie takes entirely in place inside the the opposite world, inside the Drawfee internet world. And the end credit sequence is just like maybe Schmidt or Nando um, or somebody, anybody really could just uh, 
yeah, they realize that maybe Luce has been released into our world, but we never see that. Um, Because I think that's such a cool moment inside the first Avengers when you're watching it, and then Thor drops onto that helicopter uh, or plane or whatever. It's just such a, like, oh my gosh, like... Thor's here. I he's from another dimension, like another planet, basically, and he's here too. Like it's such a cool feeling. So I think it's important to see. We never see Luce inside the real world. So when he shows up, it's like, oh my gosh! And even Luce is here in whatever finale against his brother. So yeah, I'm so creative. You can see I'm just finishing up this background now. I'm doing stairs, one of the bane of existence to all mathematicians and illustrators everywhere. The colors go through a lot of blinking. There's a lot of blinking. Um, But I use sort of a kind of traditional, I guess you could say, like a warm light for the fire and on this key. But then I end up swapping it. I felt like it didn't feel fantasy enough, like it was too literal. So by the end of this illustration, you're going to see those flames will eventually become blue and this key becomes this really great red hot spot. Um, And I just felt like it made red is such a great light for Luce. Like, I feel like whenever Karina draws him, it's typically with that, like, burning kind of red light and energy. And it just looks good on his tan skin. So that's very fun. Um, Yeah, you can see what I mean when I say adjustment layers are a very big part of my process. I am constantly just messing around and finding out. (laughs) But yes, there's the red glow. I found that important. I remember that Rory had like that weird Peridot hand, like, you know, Peridot from Steven Universe has those like floating fingers. It's the same thing with Rory, except instead of fingers, it's these little crystals that make little hands. That's fun. Um, But yeah, these are pretty much the finished colors. You see that I'm just, the last thing I do is lighten this archway and I just mess with the levels a little bit. This is just futzing. Uh, And yeah, I add glitter to both the key and to Dahlia's suit because I just, you know, gay. (laughs) It made me happy. Let me have glitter. Um, This is the finished uh, poster for the Loose movie. So now we're on to our fifth and final installment, which is, of course, movie five, Draw Detectives. Of course, the final movie is Draw Detectives. Do you think I'm silly? Do you think I don't understand how this works? Uh, Draw Detectives, I think, is one of the most beloved properties that Drawfee has ever made, in my opinion. I feel like it gets the most fan art, the most recognition. These are very important characters, and I think they're just so delightful. But they obviously, this takes place in a D&D inspired world, so I think that this movie is squarely in the digital world, much like the last one. However, I think that this is a little more of a standalone, the same way that our Camp Counselor movie was in the real world, but we really do not draw attention to the whole internet existence. I feel like this movie, there really is no reference to the fact that there is a quote unquote real world until the after credit scene. I think we get a pure 100% draw detectives movie. And it doesn't need to even be a recap of season one or season two. I would just love to see a movie where we meet these detectives. Um, This piece is actually inspired by a piece by that artist. What's his name? Norman Rockwell, who drew the Thanksgiving turkey image that is so Americana and iconic. He did a painting called Sunday, which has this grumpy man who I loved in it. So I used that composition as reference. I cast Jancy as the grumpy old man, obviously, because she's the matriarch of this found family unit. And so that really felt right. And I surrounded her with her quote unquote children, which is York, Rose, and Grendon. And this is really fun. You can see I'm working on York's inks right now. His outfit is based off of Mugler. The only reason why I love Mugler so much is because, fun fact, all of the villains and a lot of the heroes. Um, costumes in the Sailor Moon manga were based off of Mugler designs. So if it's good enough for uh, Sailor Moon, it's good enough for me. So (laughs) I typically check out those runways just to be 
a little more fashion conscious. And then now I'm working on Grendon, whose outfit I based off of that children's book character, Madeline, who's this little French girl who's being raised by a nun. I don't really remember the plot of Madeline that well, but that was the inspiration for the hat. So I gave it a bow, which I just thought was so cute. And I gave them this pea coat and some shorts underneath, but I kept their signature sandals, but I did give them socks just so it felt you know, I don't know, kind of cozy because everyone's, it's funny, you know, everyone's wearing a jacket, so it's cold outside, but at the same time, it's like all of York's abs are out. So, you know, that cold draft and (laughs) Grendon's wearing shorts. So it's sort of this hot, cold outfit. Who knows what the temperature really is? Yeah, now I'm inking Jancy. Uh, It was fun to do this bedhead look because I think Jancy is normally depicted as being very well put together, except for spoilers in season two when she has amnesia. She's a little more casual, but yeah, I just liked the idea of it's a Sunday morning and it's Jancy's day off. So she's still in (laughs) her robe, like she just woke up and she's reading the paper. Um, This was inside the painting that I'm referencing, but there's like going to be scattered papers also on the ground. But basically the plot of the movie is It's her day off, but in the paper on the front page, there's going to be a crime of some sort, probably a murder. Um, Yeah, I think I settled on old woman found dead. So (laughs) they're just supposed to be going to the park or to see a movie or something. So all of the dream team, the draw detectives came over and they were like, Jancy, get out of bed. We were all going to go see a Sunday matinee or something. And instead it's like, oh, look here, there's there was this woman was found dead under mysterious circumstances. And then obviously they're going to find themselves being like roped into it and having to solve this murder. And yeah, and over the course of the movie, we can understand each of the characters and what they're like. Uh, understanding that Rosé is like the roguish type who doesn't really follow rules and that York is our resident himbo and that Grendon is like the leader, but is still stupid. They're all kind of sharing one brain cell. Um, But yeah, I guess I think Grendon is the most capable, I think. So yeah. Oh, and then here's Eugene that I'm drawing. So he's going to be looking out the window and the old woman who was found dead that I mentioned earlier is going to show up as a ghost, like looking in through the window. Um, And she's come to Jancy True's residence being like, help, I was actually murdered. (laughs) And so that's going to be the thing that, um, you know, starts off their whole adventure for this day. So now you can see I'm working on the background. I'm just using red as a nice contrasting color so I can really see what I'm doing. And I'm just putting in all of these beautiful pieces of newspaper. Oh, this background was so fun to do because like I said, I had reference, so it was just way more bearable, but I did take some liberties and make some small changes here or there, but nothing too drastic. And it did raise my confidence and motivation so I could go back and finish the <laughs> um, the piece for both Hunter Richardson and Sarah Pena because yeah, I just, that background was not doing, but this one was giving... I don't know, there's something about backyards. They're just so fun. I noticed once I finished all five pieces that there was a window scene for both the Moonpaw one and this one. But I just liked how even though both of them had a window, they feel so different. Because one, they're at different times of day. Like the Moonpaw one is at night and this one's in the morning. But two, you can just do so much with framing devices. Like I loved how Norman Rockwell had just these little leaves from a fake plant on the inside of the house. Like it added such depth. Ugh, so smart, so genius. And yeah, now I'm just putting in the colors, which I think is where I departure most from the Norman Rockwell piece. I go for these sort of orange and blue greens, uh, but I add a lot of texture and grain. Ah, look at that, it's so toasty, so morning. I love that burnt orange, it makes me so happy. And then I took colors, from the background to like place on the newspaper. I don't know if that makes any sense, but there's one paper that's supposed to be comics. So I wanted to make sure that there was some colors that matched in that area. 
Um, yeah, so now I'm just adding some shadows. We are very quickly approaching the end of the final one. <gasps> oh no, over so soon. I love the little highlights that I just give everyone. Some little memories of shadow, there it is. And this is the last thing I do, which is draw the ghost who is based off of all those old ladies that the drawfy people draw all the time. Yeah, this is this is pretty much it. This is the finished illustration. Oh my gosh, that was so fast. But those were my five ideas for five movies. And yeah, that would be first setup movies. Now, granted, these are just the setup. So the final movie, which would be the Avengers movie, I don't quite know what that would be because I haven't drawn it yet. But if you want to see me draw what the crossover event would be, let me know in the comments down below and like this video. So I know you want to keep seeing more stuff like it. I really enjoyed coming up with the concepts. Uh, I am an illustrator, but I do love writing. So it's fun to be able to work my brain in that way. And yeah, tell me your favorite movie idea, any headcanons that you would want to see or characters you would want to be explored in each of these five movies. And what characters would be like the um, Black Widow character or the Hawkeye, you know, that don't have their own movies, but there's sort of this connective tissue between them. Let me know in the comments down below who you think uh, would fit that bill uh, out of the Rafi catalog. And yeah, if you really want to support the channel, you can check me out on Patreon, link down below, where for just like $4 a month, you can have your name in the end credits. And speaking of end credits, here they are now. Special thanks to Anna Sophia Boyd, Axilius the Great, Bodhi, Blue Uwu, Kay Clark, Christopher, Dabadudu, Dax Quinn, Aaron Martin, Emoe, Gay Jarris, J. Johar, JD Boy 2000, Johan, Kitsune Chibiko, Lucky Paradox, Melon, Mild Mothman, Mistake, Native Runner, Orion Amastasia, Pinecone, Potion Cellar Door, Rin, Scorching Ray, Sir Camelot, Smalls the Sax Jammer, Shernanigans, Tad the Turtle, Tarthalinor, The Real Michael, Thumper Daytime, Thony, Tortilla Chips, Tuesdays Anyways, Tundra Katie Bean, and Tuppence Pies. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Nathan, and I'll upload a new video real soon. <laughs> Bye!